I begin in the name of Almighty Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. May the blessings of Almighty Allah be showered upon the noble Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family and his companions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Greetings of peace to you, ladies and gentlemen. The Social Services Department of the Royal Commission of Jubail and Yanbo welcomes you to this lecture on Islam by Sheikh Ahmad Dida, entitled The Last Challenge and the last call. Before we begin this evening's proceedings, we shall hear a short recital from the Holy Quran by our young brother, Fahad al garani The reading will be from the chapter entitled, The Jinn. Brother Fahad, to Faddin.
Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce myself? My name is Dr. Muhammad Khalid. I embraced Islam 31 years ago. I come from Britain and I am presently employed by the Royal Commission here in Jubail. Today I have the distinct pleasure and honor to be chairman of this lecture, which will be presented by our venerable guest, Brother Ahmed Didat. Brother Ahmed describes himself as a servant of Allah. We pray that Almighty Allah will grant him the pleasure of continuing to serve the cause of Islam, inshallah. I shall shortly tell you more about our guest speaker. First, please permit me to explain to you what is the objective of our exercise this evening. We are all here in this auditorium this evening in order to increase our awareness of the grace and mightiness of Almighty Allah. We are his servants, and before him, we shall one day appear in order to be judged regarding our conduct in this life here on earth. Our guest speaker, Brother Ahmed Dida, is with us this evening in order to enlighten us more on this subject. However, in order for us to gain the maximum benefit from his expertise, there are a few simple ground rules of which I need to inform you. Brother Ahmed will be speaking for approximately one hour. During that time, we hope that you, the audience, will give him the benefit of your undivided attention. He has kindly consented to entertain your questions following his lecture. At that time, I shall be pleased to inform you as to the way in which we shall conduct that portion of our evening's activities. Please let me now introduce our speaker. We in Jubail are indeed most pleased to welcome Brother Ahmed once again to our city. Brother Ahmed hardly needs any further introduction. As you are aware, he comes from the Republic of South Africa, where he has long been a champion in the cause of Islam. There, he founded and led the Islamic Propagation Center International, which has been engaged in spreading the message of Islam for the past 33 years. Brother Ahmed is also an accomplished propagator of the message of Islam worldwide. He is a prolific writer, having authored over 60 books, booklets, pamphlets, and articles on various aspects of Islam and the lesser religions. He is an accomplished debater, having crossed swords, metaphorically speaking, on several occasions with defenders of the lesser religions. He has been energetic, tireless, and fearless in his life's work of spreading knowledge of the word of Allah the Almighty. In 1986, in recognition of his efforts, he was awarded the King Faisal International Award for Services to Islam. We pray that Almighty Allah will bless his efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, without more ado, I am pleased to present to you Brother Ahmed Didad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإن كنتم في ريب مما نزلنا على عبدنا فأتوا بسورة من مثله ودعوا شهدات من دون الله إن كنتم صادقين فإن لم تفعلوا ولن تفعلوا فاتقوا النار التي وكودها الناس والحجارة عدت للكافرين صدق الله صدق الله نور نزيم مستر شيرمان and my dear brothers and sisters, it gives me great pleasure to share with you my thoughts on the subject announced, the last challenge and the best call. The last challenge happens to be in the last book of God. We have two leading books competing for the hearts and minds of mankind. 
the Holy Bible and the Holy Quran. For the benefit of my Muslim brethren who might not know what the Bible is, I give them a brief introduction. This book, which is called the Holy Bible, is divided into two sections. There is in this book, the major part of it is called by the Christians the Old Testament. And the smaller part at the end is called the New Testament. Now what is the Old Testament? Everything that came before Jesus to the prophets and the sages is contained in the book of the Jews, the Bible of the Jews, which the Christians call it old. Everything that came after Jesus, they call it new. The old and the new put together, they call it the Holy Bible. So this book, the Holy Bible, is divided into Old Testament and New Testament. So I as a Muslim, I say that if you have the Old Testament and if you have the New Testament, we have the last testament, the final message of God to mankind. And this is not entirely something new. This is a continuation of the teachings of Moses and Jesus. It's a continuation. It is the same religion on a different level, on a, which we believe a higher level. Now in this book, in the verses that I read to you, two verses, from Surah Al-Baqarah. Surah Al-Baqarah. And if you have a Quran like this, a translation, this is the translation, uh, with 114 chapters, 2,000 pages, where will you find Baqarah? I'm speaking now more directly to the non-Muslim who might not have access to this book, and even to the Muslim who is not used to this book, 2,000 pages, and you're looking for Baqarah. Where do you find Baqarah? But if you have this particular one, it is available outside. They're selling it, as, I noticed that they're selling it outside. For 45 riyals, this 2,000 pages encyclopedia. There, in this book, at the end of it, there is an index. A very comprehensive index. Whatever you want to know, it's made easy for you. Open the index, looking for Baqarah. Under B, just like in a dictionary, look for Baqarah. It'll tell you chapter 2. And 2 is easy to find because every page is numbered. Once you have found chapter 2, as I'm telling you now, it's ayah number, verse number 23 and 24. Very easy to find. Anything you want to know. You want about marriage in the house of Islam? Forbidden marriages? with whom you can, with whom you can't, open M, marriages. You want to know about divorce, under D, you find divorce, everything about divorce in Islam. You want to know about heaven, you want to know about hell, under H. You want to know about man, under M, the purpose of the creation of man, and all that creation, under C, what you want to know, everything on your fingertips. The non-Muslim, most especially the Christian who lives in our midst, he might want to know about his Jesus. What does this book say about my Jesus? He, he's asking. So I said, open J, and it'll tell you everything about Jesus, everything on your fingertips. When we remind our Christian fellow countrymen who live with us that Jesus Christ is mentioned in this book no less than 25 times by name. We call him Isa, Jesus. Masihu Isa ibn Maryama, Christ Jesus, the son of Mary. As Jesus, the son of Mary, he is named 25 times in the book. And the strange thing about this book is this, that the name Muhammad occurs only five times. Can you imagine a man who's supposed to have brought this book? He's supposed to have written this book. He mentions his own name four times as Muhammad and one time as Ahmad, which is a syn synonym for the same name, all together five times, named Jesus 25 times. Strange. The birth of Jesus, his annunciation, how God created him by a miracle, is all recorded. Then there is a chapter in the Holy Quran entitled Surah Maryam, 
meaning chapter Mary, in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. There is no chapter, such chapter, if you know, in the Christian Bible. It has 66 books, and there's not a single book called Mary, Maryam. In the Quran, there is a whole chapter dedicated to her, Surah Maryam, chapter Mary. What do people say about this book, the Westerner? Naturally, we as Muslims, we will look up to it, respect it, and praise it to the highest. It's understood. But what does the unbeliever say? Reverend Bosworth Smith, Reverend Bosworth Smith, in his book, Muhammad and Muhammadanism, I think you people here in this country, you all know, I hope you know by now, that there is no such creature as a Muhammadan, and there is no such religion as Muhammadanism. But this man, writing this book more than 50 years ago, the whole world was calling us Muhammadans, and our religion was Muhammadanism. Now you know better that the name of our religion is Islam, a religion of total submission to God's will, and we, the followers, are called Muslims, meaning people who have submitted their wills to the will of God. But in his book, Muhammad and Muhammadanism, Reverend Bosworth Smith says, referring to the Quran and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, he says, illiterate himself, who Muhammad, an unlearned person, illiterate himself, scarcely able to read or write. He was yet the author of a book. Of course, we take exception that Muhammad was not the author of a book, but this is his belief. This is what his opinion is. He says, he was yet the author of a book, which is a poem, a code of laws, a book of common prayers, and a Bible all in one. And is reverenced to this day by a sixth of the whole human race as a miracle of purity of style, of wisdom and of truth. It is the one miracle claimed by Muhammad. His standing miracle, he called it, and a miracle indeed it is. This is from, coming from a Christian missionary. He says, this is a miraculous book. One man, 1400 years ago, in the desert, a man who couldn't sign his own name, name, he goes and formulates a book of this magnitude. How do you account for it? The most voracious writer in the Christian Bible is Saint Paul. In the New Testament, he has authored 14 books. Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians, Thessalonians, Hebrews, Book of Romans, and on. 14 books he has authored. More than half the New Testament is authored by one man. And if I just get those 14 books together, 14 books, there won't be more than this. All the 14 put together. The biggest writer, 40 books all put together would be not more than this. This is a one-man job. If he did it, if Muhammad did the job, it's a one-man job. The whole Bible, 40 different authors went to produce this. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Joshua, Micah, Elisha, Elijah, and on and on. 40 different persons went to formulate this book, the Christian Bible, and this one man job. And this man, he didn't know how to read or write. He couldn't sign his own name. Then A.J. Arbery, an Englishman, he takes the trouble of translating the Quran into English. And in his preface, he says, whenever I hear the Quran chanted, meaning beautifully recited like the young child was doing, Whenever I hear the Quran chanted, it is as though I'm listening to music. It is though I'm listening to music. Underneath the flowing melody, there is sounding all the time the insistent beat of a drum. It is like the beating of my heart. He can't help. If he understands, he can't help vibrating with it. It is like the beating of my heart. It's a Christian talking. Then Mami Duke Pictol. An Englishman, he also translated the Quran into English. And when he translates the Quran, in his preface he says that the sound of the which moves men to ecstasy and tears. You don't have to be really a believer. 
If you listen to people like Abdul Samad Abdul Basit reciting the Quran, you just can't help vibrating. I have seen with my own eyes a Frenchman who didn't understand a word of the Quran, the Arabic Quran, and when he's listening to Basit, I can see him swaying. He just couldn't control himself. But there are people who can be hardened themselves and laugh it off. It is quite in order. It depends upon our prejudice. We can develop prejudices and we can ignore the most beautiful things. So now in this last and final revelation of God, God Almighty gives the final warning. Chapter 2, verse 23, 24. He says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ if there is anyone who has any doubts with regards to what we have revealed to our servant, Muhammad, from time to time, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مثلي. Come on then, you produce a chapter, a surah like it. And we are assured that not only that you won't be able to do this, you will never, never be able to do this. It's a standing challenge for 1400 years. That you, the whole world put together, Another place Allah says, Qulla in ijtama'atil insu wal jinnu. Say if the whole of mankind and jinns, the spirit world, were to, were to gather together, wa in kuntum fi raibim mimma nazzalla ala abdina, fa'atu bi suratim min misli. Then produce a chapter like it. They will not be able to produce a chapter like it. And it carries on to say that this is God's book and there is, it can't be reproduced. That's a challenge, a standing challenge. Now, in accepting a challenge of that kind, you see, if it's a miracle, it is claimed to be a miracle, then you must have the freedom to challenge it. There are certain barriers. The non-Muslim world, generally, they have a good excuse to say, look, we don't know Arabic. It's a good excuse. But there are, in the world today, 15 million Arab Christians. And they are not all simpletons. Some of the geniuses, Tariq Aziz, you heard the name? The foreign minister of Iraq. Who is he? An Arab Christian. And in his hierarchy, there are a number of Arab Christians. Then in Egypt, there are 10 million Egyptian Christians, Coptic Christians, 10 million. In the Lebanon, there are thousands of millions of Christians. And all put together, 15 million Christians today and they know Arabic as their mother tongue. The very first book of Arabic that I ever came across, I wanted to learn Arabic as a young man. And uh, I went to the bookshops in my youth and I found a book, Egyptian Arabic by Spiro Bey. I went, later on discovered that Spiro Bey was a Christian. I started learning Arabic, Wahid, Ithnain, Thalasa, Arba, Hamsa, but I didn't go very far. But first book I ever had in my life in my hand to learn the language was written by a Christian Arab. And they run magazines and newspapers. However, for 1400 years the challenge has stood, but the Christians were not sleeping. The Arab Christians, they had a 16-year project. They want to meet the challenge. So they gathered their learned men, and after 16 years, they did produce something. They call this, i uh, just read the title. What's the title? Siratul Masih. Siratul Masih. Bil Arabiya. Fasih. You know, in eloquent Arabic. They want to match the Quran. So they wrote a book. This one here. This is the New Testament, but this is in a language absolutely different from the Bible in Arabic. I have the Bible in Arabic, but this is something different. This was addressed to the Muslims. Says, you see, you have a challenge in the Quran. Produce something like it. We have produced it. So we read it. And I read some sections to you from the very start. Very first sentence of this book begins. This is to accept the Quranic challenge. It begins. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Is there a Muslim here who would take objection to that? Huh? This is in the Christian Bible. He now begins with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Actually, the first verse of the Quran. 
In the Holy Quran, every chapter begins, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. 114 chapters, out of which 113 begins with this formula. So now the Christians want to challenge the book. To challenge the book, what they do? They plagiarize. This is called plagiarism, meaning stealing in literature. To meet a challenge, you don't steal the man's own words. They stole the first verse of the Quran. Now for every chapter in this book, there is no Christian Bible on earth. No revelation came down from heaven. But every chapter now, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This this Christian Bible now. Bismillah. And he's catching the unwary. Any non any Muslim, non Arab, immediately says it's the Quran. And if it's read like Basit reads, we lap it up. Anything. It is Allah's kalam. Because we are used to listening to Allah's kalam, the way the young child was reciting to us. And I gave you some examples which I, at the first reading, naturally I was terrified. Because I'm a non-Arab, and I don't know Arabic as a language. What I'm quoting to you is what I read in Arabic. I can read in Arabic, but I don't understand the meaning, so I need a translation. So what I know from a translation, I'm sharing with you. But when I read this, naturally I'm getting terrified, because while I'm reading, I can recognize words which are Quranic. I'm used to listening to those words, and I see them here, and I see them there, as if it's a new revelation coming with Quranic words. I give you an example. The Arabs, I don't know. Look, I want you to hold your peace. Don't laugh. Because um, I've seen people go berserk laughing. They go out, out of control laughing at this 16-year project. I don't want you to laugh. Please. You know, I hope you promise me you don't laugh. Just listen. Now, I'm trying to read the way I would read the Quran. But I don't know. I think... If you read it, you know, your own usual Arabic way. I know I didn't tell you. I'm sure they, we can get a volunteer. You know, try to read with the tartil, like we, you read the Quran, like Bismillah, like Basit, not as good as Basit, but the best that you can. Can I get a volunteer, please? Come, come, my son, come. From here, just read a few lines. See, just a few lines. Start from the top and all this. But try to read as you would read the Quran at home. You know, like the young child was trying to read. Okay. Try, try. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. قل يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله حقا فأمنوا بي ولا تخافوا إن لكم عند الله جنات نزلا فلا أسبقنكم إلى الله لأعدها لكم ثم لآتينكم نزلة أخرى وإنكم لتعرفون السبيل إلى قبلة العليا فقال له توما الحواري مولانا إنا لا نملك من ذلك علما فقال له عيسى أنا هو الصراط إلى الله حقا ومن دوني لا تستطيعون إليه سبيلا I'm very happy that my brothers are as disciplined as the American soldiers last night I I lectured to them at uh, in Dhamam, was it? Dahran, in Dahran. And I noticed the discipline, which we envy, I envy. That they sat there throughout the lecture, and uh, the chairman, he finished his uh, contribution, then he called another Qari to end it with a prayer, with, and the American soldiers didn't move. It doesn't happen to us. While our chairman is still, Talking, he said, now the lecture is over, and you find people start scattering, not the American soldier. He is disciplined, trained, and something that we can emulate. In this one little instruction, I'm glad that my brethren held their peace. But in Riyadh, when they heard this, you know, the whole hall was howling with laughter. Jazakallah. So now this is the challenge which they have met. The Arab knows what it, what it is worth, but 
You can catch fish with this in Malaysia, in Bangladesh, in Indonesia, in Africa. They can catch fish with this. He said, look, here it is, your Quran challenges, and we have produced the challenge, we have answered your challenge. And in that, words from the Quran, about 20 to 40 percent are words picked from the Quranic text and fitted in hukko by crook somehow to make it sound Quranic. So this book is a challenge, is a standing challenge. Not only in its eloquence, but in its substance matter, could never have come from Muhammad From the scientific point of view, I can show you something there. From the psychological point of view, from the gynecological point of view, and so on and so on. And each and every one, the man of learning, we will marvel is that a man in the desert 1400 years ago could never have invented this book. He could never have written this book. This is not the work of man. The best call out of this final book, the final revelation, the last challenge, is that the Holy Prophet Muhammad is in Medina. Towards the end of his earthly life, he is relaxed. The whole of Arabia was at his feet. They had embraced Islam. He can sit back and relax. It was simply a question of polishing up the Muslims, making them better Muslims. As a people as a whole, Saudi Arabia, not known as Saudi as Arabia, they had accepted Islam. He can sit back and relax in his old age. Not so. Allah bari ta'ala sends Akhi Jibreel, the Archangel Gabriel, and commands him, Wama arsalaka. Illa kafatal lin nasi bashiram wa naziram walakin na aktar an nasi la yalamun. Said, We have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a giver of glad tidings and as a warner. Walakin na aktar an nasi la yalamun. But the bulk of mankind, they still do not know. There's no time to sit back, there's no time to relax, there's work to be done. But the bulk of mankind still don't know. They haven't received the message. Arabia is there, but is Arabia the whole world? Are they Allah's only people? No. The whole world is hungry and thirsty for this message of God. The last and final revelation. What can he do? He couldn't run in all directions? Impossible. 1400 years ago in the desert, what can he do? The best thing he could do was to call the scribes, people who could read and write, call the scribes, people who could write, and dictated letters. Five letters that we know of, most commonly known, five letters. One, to the emperor of Persia, the emperor at Constantinople, the king of Egypt, the king of Yemen, and the Nagas of Abyssinia. These five, everybody quotes. But he wrote 300 letters. 1400 years ago, in the desert, he wrote 300 letters to people, chiefs, and nobles all over his surroundings. 300. In modern parlance, if we convert it today, we would say 300,000 letters he wrote. The busiest man in history. Nobody would give him peace. He had a nation to build, a religion to complete, to perfect. And he's writing letters, calling scribes, writing letters, 300. Out of the one that went, I have seen one out of those five. I saw it in the Top Kapi Museum in Istanbul, Turkey. It is well preserved. The Turks have preserved it well. 1400 year old letter. It's like parchment. Something like leather but parchment. The writing I couldn't decipher because it is written scratchy writing. 1400 years ago, the way they used to write. Today, for our benefit, mostly for the non-Arab, they now make it easier for us. Bold, round hand with the vowel points at the respective places, making it easy for us to read. The Arab, he can read without those vowel points, because it is his language. But we, the non-Arabs, we need those vowel points. They were not there in the, in the beginning. Because he understood his language and he could make out. This is Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praises due to Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the world. But now the non-Arab, without the wild points, he, will, he won't know whether to say Alhamdo or Ilhamdo or Ulhamdo. He won't know what is what, how to pronounce his word. 
So for the benefit of the non-Arab, these vowel points were added, and we are now in a position to read it more easily. So side by side with the script, that parchment, there is another facsimile of that in modern handwriting. So if you read the modern one, today's one, then you'll be able to read the other one. Because you can see now, you can have something to lean on. It's, yes, I can see it's written there. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. From Muhammad Rasulullah, from Muhammad the Messenger of God, to Heraclius, the Emperor at Constantinople. Accept Islam and be benefited. Then an ayah from the Quran. Qul, say, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, ta'ala, come. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. And the terms and conditions of getting together. This man in the desert gave out. Not him, Allah gave through him. Number one, Allah, that we worship none but Allah, the one and only God that there is. By the way, this is the name of God. In the language of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, the name for God Almighty is Allah. You can call him by any name. The Muslim would say, call him by any name, except that the name be not contaminated. You call God, the Quran says, by any name. Call him Rahman, call him Rahim, call him by any name, the most beautiful name befitting to him. But any name that is contaminated, you do not use for him. Meaning that if you use a name and it conjures up a mental picture of a man or a woman or an animal, of a tree or a mountain, you say, for example, you say the name of God Almighty is Rama. If you know Hindu history, it conjures up a mental picture of a man. I have been reading the Ramayana, and immediately I know what, who you're talking about. That type of man, his wife was Sita, and she was abducted by the Ravana, the king of Ceylon, and he kept all the whole picture comes to you in your mind. The name is contaminated. Don't use such a name. Call him Moses. So no, immediately he says, the man who liberated the Jews from the Egyptian bondage, and in the Sinai, his people gave him endless trouble for 40 years, and he moved and he died, and so on and so on. A mental picture, out. Call him Jesus. He says, the child born in the stable to a Jewish girl called Mary, and he was circumcised on the eighth day, and according to Christian law, that he was crucified at the age of 30, or 33, 33. Mental picture. His name is Muhammad, some fools might say. Immediately it conjures up a mental picture of a camel driver born in Mecca some 1400 years ago. His father's name was Abdullah, his mother's name was Amina, and so on and so on. Immediately you have a mental picture. Any name that produces a mental picture is not befitting Allah, is not befitting God. Any name. So in Islam, we are jealously guarding this name. Allah is his name. And this is the name of God Almighty even in the Bible. Which Bible? People keep on asking, which Bible? I say, look, there are dozens and dozens of versions. But in every version, the name Allah is there. Every version. Any version. There is a group of people, they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. They originate in America. They are the most militant group among the Christians. They are the fastest growing cult in the world today, Jehovah's Witnesses. That group of people, they are propagating throughout the world that the name of God Almighty is Jehovah. They go and ask other Christians, he says, what is the name of God? So you say, God. He says, God is not a name. God means an object of worship. You say the God of the Hindus, gods of ancient Greece. God is a name term applied to any object of worship. Like the Frenchman says, money my God, woman my guide. It's not a name. God is not a name. It's a title, an object. What's his name? Is a father? Is it your father is God? He says, no. What's his name? Then he would say his name is Jehovah. All right, for a moment we accept. But it says, you know, in the New Testament, in the original Greek, you say it was preserved in Greek, you said yes. The original revelation of God, you said yes. In the 27 books of the New Testament, the word Jehovah does not occur even once. 
not once in 27 books in the original. So what kind, of name, what kind of a name is this? If God Almighty inspires his book, why is he ashamed to put his, reveal his name? That means afraid, he's ashamed. Like saying, Saddam, my name is Saddam. The, anyway, you are a child, maybe you have named him some, out of some love for the guy, but as the child is growing, is going to school, it will be difficult for him, I'm Saddam. Or in Western I'm Hitler. You don't say, I'm Hitler. Maybe you are an innocent man, you may be a priest, you may be a very kind, saintly person, but say, I'm Hitler, what's your name? Say, Hitler. What's my name? Say, Saddam. No, it's very, very difficult, you see. So now, is God ashamed of his own name? If that is his name, I say, in the 27 books, the word does not occur even once. And you say, God dictated it? He inspired it? You said, yes. Then how is it that his name is not there? In the 27 books, not there at all. So we say, look, amazing thing. The name Allah is still there. In your book, they have their own translation called New World Translation. They don't accept this Protestant Bible. They don't accept it. They have their own translation called New World Translation. I said, in your New World Translation, Allah is there. In the Zulu Bible is there. In the Arabic Bible is, has to be. In the 2,000 different languages in which the Christian world has translated the Bible, in the 2,000 different languages, the word Allah is there. It's not been, they have not been able to eliminate it. Amazing. So where is it? I said, look, you remember when Jesus Christ is supposed to have been on the cross. According to Matthew and, and Mark or Luke, in two places, he is made to say, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. So I'm asking, does Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani sound to you like Jehovah, Jehovah, lama sabachthani? He says, no, unless there's some sickness in your ear. I said, listen, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Does that sound to you like Abba? Abba lama sabachthani? Abba means father in Hebrew. He says, no. Then I said, listen. Eli, Eli lama sabachthani in Hebrew. Allah, Allah lama taraktani in Arabic. Sound similar? Eli, Eli lama sabachthani. He said, Allah, Allah lama taraktani. Sound similar? He said, yes. Then I said, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, of the Bible, John the disciple, he sees a vision. And in the vision, he hears the angels in heaven singing, Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. I'm asking the Christians, have you heard that before? Yes. When the Christian goes into ecstasy, like we say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. What does the Christian say? Alleluia, Alleluia. I said, right. I want to know what is Alleluia. Is it hip hooray, hip hooray? Is that what it means? No. What is Alleluia? I'm asking, what is Alleluia? Alleluia, you see, the Arabs and the Jews, we begin with an exclamation in our language. It's the genius of the language. Alleluia, we start with Ya. That's the genius of Arabic and Hebrew. I say, Ya Akhi, oh my brother, Ya Ummi, oh my mother, Ya Allah, oh Allah. We start with Ya, you, the Westerner, ends with Ya, meaning exclamation mark. You say, Fah! Exclamation mark. Stop! You say exclamation mark. Your thing ends, your exclamation is at the end, our starts with the beginning. So, Alleluia is Ya Allah, Lu, Ya Allah, Lu, Ya Allah, Hu, Ya Allah, Hu. I say, that is what we are singing. We are singing. The Muslim is singing. Oh Allah, you are the only being who deserves worship and praise. Oh Allah, you are the only being who deserves worship and praise. Ya Allah, hu, ya Allah, hu, on the cross, Allah, 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 my Allah, my Allah, my Allah, my Allah. This is his name, as it is there to be found today. But people, the name gets stuck in the throat. The name gets stuck. They don't want to hear that word. So when I tell them, I says, you know, in my meetings, in my country, and other places in the Western world, when sometimes the Christian comes along and he asks a question, and all the other Christians shout, Alleluia! They have done it. You see, this, you have done it. Great. In other words, saying, Hippie hooray! Hippie hooray! So I started explaining. I said, You see, thank you very much for praising the name of the Lord. And what you're saying is that, Ahu Allah, you be praised. And I said, I thank you very much because this is how the word comes about. 
ya allah lu ya is ya allah lu ya allah hu ya allah hu ya allah thank you very much for reminding the people that praise the lord praise allah no more no more hallelujahs believe me no more hallelujahs you just explain to the guy said look this is what you're doing thank you very much thank him for it and no more hallelujahs finish the silence for good so how are mr chairman and my dear brothers and sisters you see i i can, I can continue talking to you in the different aspects of the final call let me say about the final call when that letter was sent in that in the middle of that letter was kul ya ahl al kitab ta'alu ila kalimatin sabaim bainana wa bainakum so oh people of the book let us get onto a common platform in the worship of the one true god allah na abud illa allah wa la nushrika bihi shay'an and that we associate no partners with him wa la yattakhiz ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min duni allah and that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than allah fa in tawallaw but if they turn back فَقُلُوا شَهَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ Tell them that we are Muslims. We have submitted our wills to the will of God. That is the final call, the last call, the best call. Can we find another? Calling the religions of the world to get together onto a common platform. Better principles of getting together. Worship of the one true God, the only God that there is. And that we associate no partners with him. and from among ourselves as if a sheikh or an imam or a bishop or a pope or a rabbi he deserves any special position other than the knowledge that which he has we respect the man for his knowledge whether he is a pope or a bishop or a rabbi or a sheikh or an alim we respect the man but otherwise he has no right or authority over you other than that which is given by god almighty in his holy book with these words i am very grateful for organizing this meeting and i'm at your disposal and at question time since the mics are provided i would like my muslim brethren to give our non muslim friends a chance first you see in uh, what was it bureda at question time the first man that came there he had to identify himself muslim he asked the question i answered the second man came there he identified himself muslim i answered his question third gentleman came there again Muslim, he identified himself. I answered his question. Fourth guy, fifth fellow, I said, "Hey, are you a Muslim?" He said, "Yes." I go and sit down. Give our Christian brothers a chance. So tonight, before we it starts, you know, deteriorating the situation, allow our Christian brethren a chance first. And if there's nobody to ask any question, means they accept everything that I've said. That means they have accepted Islam. They are converted. Then there's no problem. Then we give to the Muslims a chance to come and ask me a question. My dear brother, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Brother Ahmed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of you, I I wish to express our profound appreciation to Brother Ahmed for his thought-provoking speech here this evening. I also wish to express my appreciation for your disciplined attention throughout this lecture. Uh, I'm sure that you have been stimulated, and uh, I'm, I'm quite sure also that you wish to probe Brother Ahmed further. Uh, we would wish that you, those of you who wish to ask questions, uh, restrict yourselves strictly to the topic of this lecture. Uh, in the interests of uh, economy and equity, equality. We are forced to limit you to one question per person in the first instance. However, it may be possible, time permitting, for you to ask another question. But this would only occur after all other questioners have had an opportunity to put their questions to Brother Ahmed. Uh, the arrangement would be as follows: uh, We shall form a, an orderly queue along the right side of the auditorium. and there you will find two ushers the first one will permit you to leave the queue in order to put your questions at the microphones further up front the, the second usher at the microphones will help you will assist you in in putting your questions to your question to brother ahmed uh the procedure for putting your question will be simply that you first identify yourself then in order to facilitate good order and clarity of information we kindly request that you make your question direct brief and succinct 
to the point. After you have delivered your question, the, the second usher will direct you, will conduct you away from the microphone, and you will leave the area of the microphone by traveling, presumably along the front here, of the, at the foot of the stage. Uh, thereafter, this will permit uh, Brother Ahmed to respond uh, to your question directly, hopefully to your joint satisfaction. Uh, if you wish to pose another question, then you please walk along the rear and regain uh, a place at the end of the queue on the right side. And for the ladies, uh, their questions in writing should follow the same rules which I have just mentioned of uh, limitation, one question per person. Uh, they should be brief and also they should be succinct, direct and to the point. Uh, their question, uh, the ladies' question, will in turn be forwarded to Brother Ahmed for his response. Uh, please, I implore you, follow these guidelines, and if you do, uh, hopefully we shall have, uh, we shall all benefit from this, this exercise. Uh, may I invite you, therefore, the audience, to uh, put your questions. Uh, please join the queue here uh, at your convenience, and in the case of the ladies, please submit your questions in writing. Okay, you have a Christian for the first questioner tonight. Um, you made reference to 25 mentions of Jesus in the Quran under the name of Sidna Isa. And my question to you is, uh, do you not think that the Sidna Isa of the Quran is a completely different person from the Jesus of the Gospels? In that uh, the Sidna Isa of the Quran was not the Son of God, whereas the Jesus of the Gospels is, that the Sidna Isa of the Koran was not crucified, whereas the, Seed, uh, whereas the Jesus of the Gospels was, that the Sidna Isa of the Koran was the son of Miriam, the sister of Aaron, the brother of Moses, who therefore lived 1,500 years before the historical Jesus, the son of Mary who was not uh, Miriam, uh, Miriam the, the sister of Aaron. Uh, brother, may I just remind you that though the chairman said one question at a time, they have already asked more than a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, you, put, you are putting me to the task now of delivering another lecture. See, and will not give anybody else a chance. One question has, would be have flattened me. Now, to start with, you see, if it was one by one, it's easier for me, for this old machine, you know, to catch that one and deal with it, and the next one and deal with it is easier on this old machine. But I will try to remember, and I hope somebody will remind me if I have missed out, uh, yourself also. Don't hesitate to interject that you have, answered, you have not answered this or that. First is Isa. The Quran mentions him as Isa, Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, son of Mary, translated Jesus, son of Mary. So the Christian now, uh, since you're a Christian, he says, no, this can't be the same Jesus. Because his Jesus is Jesus, son of God, not son of Mary. First is Jesus, the word Jesus. I'm asking, is that, was that his name? When he was born, Luke tells us that when he was eight days old, he was circumcised. And named, named no, don't lie, please. <laughs> now you are lying. Here's your book. Here's the Bible. I want you to read from Luke chapter 2, verse 23. I want you to read it for the benefit of the people, whether it was, what did you say just now? Jesus, the Greek form of Yeshua. <clears throat> is Yeshua written there? It's the, the Hebrew name. That was written. No, what is written in your Bible? It's the Greek Bible, Jesus. No, no, English Bible. You're talking English. What's in the English Bible? Jesus. Right. So it says, and will be named Jesus, and was named Jesus before he was in his mother's womb. He was named Jesus by the angel before he was in his mother's womb. So I'm asking, is that what the angel said, Jesus? You were better informed. You said, no, Yeshua. Right. That was his name, Yeshua, not Jesus. Then where does Jesus come from? This is the Latinized form of the Hebrew word Esau. 
See, which is a common name among the Jews. Yeheshua is classical. Like your, uh, your, your presidents, you say, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. I'm sure he was not named Jimmy by his mother and father. They must have named him James. But everybody calls him Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. So the Jimmy sticks and we call him Jimmy. But I'm sure his name was not Jimmy. Like that, you call people's name, nicknames. Jesus was never called Jesus in his lifetime. In his second coming, the whole Christian world believes that his name is Jesus. And if they recognize him and they shout, Jesus, Jesus, I assure you, my brother, he won't even look back to look at you. Because he never heard the sound Jesus in his life. So this word Esau, that is a common name among the Jews, common name, like every Tom, Dick, and Harry, the commonest name. So it didn't sound right to call him by Yeshua. When you call him Yeshua, it sounds like a Jew. Your God a Jew. You see, when you say Yeshua, it doesn't sound like a Westerner. But when you say Jesus, which is a Latinized form, Latinized, it sounds like a, a Roman name or a Greek name, a Western name. So they played a trick upon the people by now calling him Jesus, number one. So the name is Isa, Esau in Hebrew, Isa in Arabic, and Ibn Maryam. Then you say he was the son of God. In the Quran, is not son of God. Now that is a matter of belief. What is your understanding of a son of God? You see, the Muslim takes strong exception to this expression, son of God. There's a reason for that. I personally, I have no objection. If you use it in the sense that this name, this term, son of God, is used in the rest of the Bible. If you like, I would like you to read from Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, and you find there, read it to the people, how many sons of God, how many sons did God have? According to the Hebrew Bible, he had them by the tons. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, it says, and the sons of God, in the plural. In Hebrew, it's also in the plural, not dual, plural, more than two. Could be three thousand million. It says, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men, the, mean, and, they, and they took them to wife all that they chose. Verse 6, and when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, meaning had sex with them, and brought children to them, they became great men of old, men of renown. How many? How many? Tons of them. God had sons by the tons. Then in the book of Exodus, God says, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. He never said that to Jesus. He said, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In the book of Jeremiah, he says, Ephraim is my son, even my firstborn. He never called that to Jesus. Then in the book of Psalms, God speaks to David. In his book of Psalms, to David. And he says, I will declare a decree unto thee, that thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. That's David. Then in the New Testament we are told, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry, if he followed the will and plan of God, in the language of the Jew, he is a son of God, meaning a righteous person. That's all. It meant nothing more than that. It didn't mean God went and prohibited with, with Jacob's wife, Israel's wife, and Ephraim, uh, Israel's mother, and Ephraim's mother, and David's mother. Nothing of the kind. Blasphemy of the highest order. No, it means he was a righteous person, a righteous person, a righteous person, in the language of the Jew, son of God. In that sense, we are all the children of God, the good and the bad. As such, no objection. And Jesus would be closer to being the son of God, closer than any one of us, because he would be more faithful to God than any of us can ever be. From that point, we have no quarrel with the Christians. But the Christian, I don't know what church or denomination you belong, if you are an Englishman, and if you are an Anglican, or a Methodist, or a Lutheran, or a Presbyterian, then I can tell you that in your catechism, you know what's catechism? This is like what this is the Shahada, things that you believe to become a Muslim. In the Christian language, they call it catechism. In their catechism, it is said, Jesus is the only begotten Son, begotten, not made. Am I right, sir? That's what it says. 
Jesus is the only begotten son, begotten, not made, not like Adam. Adam was made by God. The Bible calls him the son of God in the Gospel of St. Luke, in the genealogy of Jesus. The last word is, and Adam the son of God. But nobody sees that. The Bible, their own Bible, every Bible on earth says Adam the son of God, but nobody sees that. They only see Jesus is the son of God. So what about Adam? Who was his father? The Bible says Adam, uh, son of God. So this is how it is. The thing is, anybody, everybody, if you follow the will and plan of God, you are a godly person in the language of the Jew, you are called son of God. So with that we have an accent. But when you say that he's begotten, not made. So I'm asking the English-speaking person, American or Britisher, when you say begotten, not made, what are you trying to emphasize? Will you please explain? And believe me, no English man has ever opened his mouth yet. I keep on asking for the past 40 years. You said, sir, begotten, not made. He said, yes. I said, will you please explain to me what are you trying to emphasize? When you say begotten, not made, what are you trying to tell me? No Englishman has ever done it yet. It had to be an American. Are you an American, sir? No. I take off my hat to the American. It was an American. I was guiding him in the mosque in a tour. And while chatting with him, I posed the question. And he said, it means sired by God. I said, what? He said, no, no, I don't say that. You ask me what it means. I'm only telling you what it means. <laughs> I didn't say that God sired him. But that's what it means. If it means anything else, I said, come, you English-speaking people, come and explain to me, I want to learn from you, your English. When you say begotten, not made. Begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. Are you attributing such a quality to God? So God Almighty in the Quran, he reacts very strongly, is what you have in your mind. If you had the same idea, son of God, son of God, as a holy man, as a righteous man, God wouldn't have reacted. But in the Quran, he reacts very strongly. In the Surah Maryam, chapter Mary, in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus, in that chapter, he, 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 he condemns this. He says, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدَا And they say that Ar-Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. سَلَّقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا إِدَّا is one of the most abominable assertions one can make. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this. You want to swear him? Call him that. The worst swearing I can give you is to swear your mother. Anything else I call you? I say, go, go, man, you're a fool. What do you do to me? You laugh. He said, this old man, maybe he's tired. Maybe he has taken some pills to stimulate himself. What? He's drinking extra coffee. What? I said, go, go, you're a monkey. Yo, you donkey. What do you do? You laugh. You laugh. But as soon as I touch your mother, what do you say? I say, old man, stop it now. Eh? Uncle, stop it. I don't want to hear one more word from you. You know, all the respect I have for you will be gone. It's already gone. But he said, all the respect will be gone. I don't want to hear one more word. Don't take my mother's name. Don't take my wife's name. Don't take my daughter's name. Don't take my sister's name. Call me what you like. Call me donkey, monkey, elephant, whatever you like. I don't care. But don't take my mother's name. Am I right? Am I right? So, God Almighty, he says, the worst swearing you can give me is this. Takadu samawatu yatafatarna minhu. Eti, the skies are ready to burst. Watan shakkal ardu. And the earth to split asunder. Wata khirrul jibalu hadda. And the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. Anda avli rahmani walada. That they should say that a Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. The heavens, if they had feelings like you, O Muslims, the heavens would have fallen. If the earth had emotions and feelings like you, the earth would have been shattered to pieces and the mountains fall down in utter ruin. But of course, it doesn't affect the Muslims. We are too big. We are nothing. This is a big joke. To our God Almighty, to Allah, it's not a joke. He's enshrined in his book that is the worst swearing anybody gives me is this. And the Muslim is laughing, is having a good time. He doesn't react. You see, he's grown some new thick skins. And may Allah forgive us. May Allah forgive us. It is our duty to go out and find these brethren of ours. They're sincere people. By God, they're sincere.
You know, they want to save us. They believe that we are all going to hell. As Allah says in the Quran, وَقَالُوا لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدًا أَوْ نَصَارَى They say that you Muslims will never, never enter Jannah. There is no heaven for you unless you become a Jew or you become a Christian. In answer to that, Allah says, Tell them, tilka amani yuhum. This is their wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucination. It's a they're babbling, babbling, bakwas. Qul, tell them, ha tu burhanakum. Qul, tell them, ha tu burhanakum. In kuntum sadiqin. If you're speaking the truth, let us have a look at your proof. I'm asking the Muslims. Have you asked the Christian for his proof? Whatever he says, ask him for his proof. Have you? A thousand years now. Have you? No. We haven't done it. You're not doing your master's job. He's telling you what to do. Qul ha tu burhan. If you had done so, wallah, it's the easiest thing in the world to talk. Because you got his burhan, everything. He says, no, it is Yeshua. I say, wait, 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 wait. You're quoting the Christian Bible in English. You read it in English. It's written as Jesus and you say, Yeshua. Why are you playing this trick? See, you're playing a trick. If that was the name, why didn't you have it in the man's name? What right had you to change it to Jesus? What right had you to Latinize his name? But that's a sickness. You see, the Christians had a sickness. Like we, subject people, have a sickness. They had a sickness. They felt inferior, giving the God Jewish name. His name, he said, I am the Messiah. That's Jewish. Just like Masih in Arabic, sounds Arabic. Messiah sounds Hebrew. So you must change it to sound like that of the European. So they found that in Greek, the word for anointed, Messiah, Messiah, is Christos. In Greek. So they took off the os, shortened it, and made it Christ. If they cry when Jesus comes in the second coming, it's like, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, he won't look back. He won't know what you're shouting about. His name is not Jesus, and his name is not Christ. But we still say... Okay, for the purpose of discussion, we will accept that Jesus Christ, the one you're talking about, is the same. But now you're talking about these things. Is that right? Let's see. The Quran says he was not crucified. See, all you asked half a dozen questions. You're not like an ordinary man. You say, look, what have you to say about this? Phew, beautiful. I deal with that. What have you to say about that? It's all right. I deal with that. But I said you dealt with a dozen different topics in one sentence, more or less. Then our brother told us, you see, you can't remember everything. But he said, you see, this Maryam is not the mother of Jesus. Surah Maryam you're talking about. This is, Muhammad is confused. He didn't use the word. But this Maryam is the sister of Harun. Aaron, brother of Moses. And that Maryam, or Maryam, sister of Harun and Musa lived some 1300 years before this Maryam. Is that correct? Is that what he said? Yes. So Muhammad is confused. Muhammad doesn't know the difference between Maryam, the mother of Jesus, and Maryam, the sister of Harun and Musa. So the man is ignorant. And an ignorant man can't guide you. That is the assumption. So he says, now let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at our Quran now. This is what the Christian says, that the Holy Prophet Muhammad didn't know the difference between Maryam, the mother of Jesus, and Maryam or Miriam, the sister of Harun and Musa. Difference in time, 1300 years. And Muhammad is confused. A confused man can't guide you to the right. We agree with that. A confused man can't guide you. What's the answer? I said, you see, this is our way of speaking. That, oh Mary, they say, Fa'atatabihi. Qawmaha tahmiluhu Surah Maryam, verse 23. Fa'atat bihi qawmaha tahmiluhu Say, at length she brought the babe to her people, carrying him in her arms. This is after the miraculous birth of Jesus. Without any male intervention, the Quran testifies. The circumstances being peculiar, when she was carrying the baby, when she was pregnant and about to deliver the baby, she retired, according to the Holy Quran, to a remote place in the East. After the delivery of the child, she returns with the babe to her people, carrying him in her arms. Her people are astonished. They know the girl is not married, and she's carrying an illegitimate child. That is what is in her mind. 
که یا اوخت هارون و سیستر هارون ما کان ابو کیم راسا و ام و ما کانت ام کی باقی یا سید او سیستر هارون یا فادر واز ا گود مین اند یور مادر واز ا ورچوس وومن شی واز نات ا ای وومن ان چیسٹ گوئنگ افٹر ڈفرنٹ مین ہاؤ از ایٹ دیٹ یو ہیو براٹ دس چائلڈ انٹو دی ورلڈ ان الیجیٹمیٹ چائلڈ دیٹ از انسینیشن دیٹ دس ماسٹر چائلڈ وی ڈیڈ یو گیٹ ایٹ فرام یا اوخت هارون ما کان ابو کیم راسا و ام و ما کانت ام کی باقی یا وٹ شی ٹو ڈو کین شی ایکسپلین ٹو دیز پیپل سینسرس پیپل دیٹ لوک یو نو آئی ہرڈ وائس اینڈ آئی بیکیم پریگنٹ اینڈ نائن منتھس لیٹر نا آئی ڈلیور دی چائلڈ وی دیر ان اے موڈ ٹو لسن ٹو ہر وڈ یو لسن ٹو یور سسٹر یو نو شی نیور اسپوک اے لائی ان ہر لائف ایز فار ایز یو نو She never spoke a lie. And she tells you, he says, you know, brother, you know, I heard some voices, and now I'm carrying a baby, and nine months later she delivers. You accept her, her word. Your mother, in the absence of your father, long time is gone somewhere, and she said, you know, she had a dream. She dreamt about your father, and now she's carrying a baby, and now she's going to deliver. You believe your mother? Huh? How can you accept this Jewish girl's words? How can anybody? So here, Allah Bari Ta'ala makes the child to come to the rescue. Fasharat ilay, but she pointed to the babe. She knew he was no ordinary child. Ask him. Ask him. So they said, Qalu kaifa nukallimu man kana fil mahdi sabiyya. Said, how can you talk to a child in the cradle? Little is a baby. How can you talk to him? And by a miracle he spoke. He defended his mother against an unbelieving audience. Saqala inni Abdullah, most certainly I am the servant of Allah. Atani al-Kitab, he's given me revelation. Waja'ala ni nabiyya, and he's made me a prophet and so on. He defended his mother against an unbelieving audience. But the charge is that Muhammad didn't know the difference between this Maryam and that Maryam. The charge still stands. So I said, you see, this is a nice respectful way of talking to her. Oh, sister of Harun, you come from such a noble family of the Levites, the priestly class among the Bani Israel. Your father was a good man and your mother was a good woman. With all that qualifications, how is it that you got a baby without a husband? I said, no, no, no. Muhammad didn't know the difference. I said, all right, my brother. In that case, I said, here, let's see. Your book. Kulhatu Burhanakum. You remember I said, Allah says, Kul hadu burhanaku. I said, look, the answer to your problem is in the first gospel of the New Testament. First gospel, first chapter, first verse. If my brother would like to read it, let the people hear. I said, the answer to your problem is in the first book of the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 1. You'll never forget in your lifetime. Three aces, one, one, one. Here, please, read it to the people. Matthew 1, 1, 1. That's the King James Version. Okay. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, right. the son of David, the son of Abraham. Right. Okay, there's the answer. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, or this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, his ancestry, how he comes about. The son of Abraham, the son of David. You understand English? That means Abraham is his father, David is his father. How many? Two fathers. Then in the Gospel of St. Luke, is a is the son of Joseph. Three fathers. Then in the Gospel of St. Mark, is a Jesus father. I'm asking a person who's got four fathers, what do you call him in your colloquial language? Tell me. Abraham is his father, David is his father, Joseph is his father, God is his father. A person who's got four fathers in, in London, what do you call that guy who's got four fathers? You think he's got four fathers, what do you call him? Huh? What do you call him? I won't say it. He says, no, 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 it doesn't mean that. Of course it doesn't mean that. I accept it doesn't mean that. So he tells me, the Christian, he said, you see, he comes from that noble family of Abraham. I said, right. He comes from the uh, royal family of David. I said, okay. He's supposed to be the, the son of Joseph the carpenter. I said, okay. But he is the son of God. I said, okay, that's the way you put it. But the Bible doesn't say all that. 
It says the son of Abraham, Abraham is his father. Son of David, David is his father. Son of Joseph, Joseph is his father. Son of God, God is his father. A man with four fathers. So I said, you see, this is how the religious language, you speak like that. But we can't take things literally. Ukhta Harun doesn't mean that her brother was Harun Musa's brother. No, no, no. And maybe they could have been a brother. She could have had a brother called Harun. But no, no. I said, this is coming from that noble family of Musa and Harun, of the Nabis, the prophets of the Bani Israel, and so on and so on. So, my dear brother, I'm glad, but I think you gave me a very big task. You see, one question <laughs> that had to be about how, I, know, I must have missed out some, but let's give somebody else a chance, somebody else a break. Anybody else? Come forward. Uh, my name is Don Sking, and I, I'm a Christian in search of a lot of things. You, 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 you use the term Last Testament for the Quran. Correct. And God has revealed to himself to us since the beginning of time. Is God going to reveal to himself, himself to us again? Um, will there be any unification of the children of God according to the Quran? Yes. You see, when we say this is the Last Testament, is nothing new because Jesus Christ before he parted he told us that beware of false prophets beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are raving wolves beware of false prophets but there is a way of knowing false from the truth how he didn't say there will be no prophets after me I am the last prophet Muhammad said that he is Khatum al Nabi and is the last and seal of the prophets. Jesus didn't say any such thing. He said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. He said, By the fruits ye shall know them. How will you know the true from the false? By the fruits. So he is telling you, there will be false prophets, beware of them, but there will be also true prophets, and by the fruit you will be able to judge them. Then in the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. You remember that, sir? Many false prophets have gone out, meaning the false prophet is a false spirit, the true prophet is a true spirit. Now, how do we know the difference between the two? The false and the true. How do we recognize them? It says, the spirit, meaning the prophet that confesseth that Jesus is the Christ, is of God. This is the test. If you must know whether this man, whoever is claiming to be a prophet, is he a true prophet of God, ask him, do you believe in Jesus? So, I said, open the book. Yeah, if you like, I open it for you and I'd like you to read it to the people. What the Quran says, it says, is qalatil malaikatu ya maryamu behold the angel said o mary inna allah yubashshiruki bi kalimatin minhu allah gives you good tidings glad tidings of a word from him is muhul masih his name will be the messiah translated christ so the spirit that confesses that jesus is the christ is of god this is the test test given to you in your own holy book i said why don't you apply it to muhammad then Jesus told us, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him. He's talking about somebody other than himself, whom he calls in John 16 again, the spirit of truth. He said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. But what, what things shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. Who is he talking about? A spirit, a ghost, a spook? No, he's talking about a man. If I reread that again, with a little emphasis on the pronouns, you can see he's talking about a man, a man, a man, and not a ghost. He says, nevertheless, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, 
the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come, he shall glorify me. Eight masculine pronouns in one verse, it ill befits a ghost or a spook. He's speaking about a man, a man, a man, and it is applicable. It fits Muhammad like a glove. We can discuss this in detail, each and every aspect of the prophecy, word for word, it fits Muhammad. But prejudices die hard, and I'm prepared to have a dialogue with my brothers. At the hotel, I'm open, come along after the closure of the meeting, and we can talk till tomorrow morning. I give you that facility, or anybody else want to come and see me at the hotel, you're most welcome. Uh, the other two questions are somewhat related. The first one, uh, the lady says that uh, there is a, a Christian woman who wants to, who is near to embrace in Islam. And she wants to know why, according to the Quran, God took Jesus up. Uh, she wants to know uh, whether God will send him back in the end. Yamul Qiyam, I presume. Um, isn't he the one who will save us in the end? Uh, the question I think you have heard about why did God take him up? To save him from an ignoble death on the cross. Here is an innocent man. He's crying to God for help. As the Bible says, being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as if it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. An innocent man crying to God for help. And he went a little further in the Garden of Gethsemane, and fell on his face and prayed to God. He said, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. He's crying to God Almighty to save him. And he said that, Which man is there of you who, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone, will ask for fish, will give him a snake? Does God do things like that? Man does. He's sadistic at times. You know, he does silly things you can't imagine. No animal does what man does. But he's trying to say that, look, people, human beings don't do that. Your son asking for food, bread, you give a stone. He's asking for fish, you give him a snake. How much more the loving Father in heaven, that God Almighty is crying to God for help, and God says, go to hell. No, God doesn't do things like that. So, according to our belief, God saved him from an ignoble death on the cross. And he's coming back. I said, so what is he going to come and do? Islam is a complete religion. Allah tells us in this book, the last and final revelation of God in the last testament is this day I have perfected for you your religion and I have completed my favors unto you and I willed that Islam should be your religion when a thing is complete when it is perfected any addition is a monstrosity look at my hand alhamdulillah you know is a normal hand like most of you but suppose we added another finger Will it improve it? Will it improve my hand? Another finger. Put another thumb. Or make it ten fingers. Will it be any better? No. Once a thing has reached perfection, you don't need anything to be added to it. So what is he going to come and do? What will Jesus come and do? The Quran tells us. Wallah, the Quran tells us. As it is mentioned, no less than 25 times in the Quran. That on the day of judgment, God Almighty will question him. So, oh Jesus, did you tell your people to worship you and your mother besides Allah? Did you? So he says, oh Baritala, oh my Lord, you know I never did any such thing. If I had done it, you would have known it. What my this people, my followers did after me is not my responsibility. I was not a watcher over them, what they were doing. They, made, they invented the Trinity and they invented everything about me which I didn't even know, I didn't even preach. So, in tu'azzibhum fa'innuhum ibaduka. That if you punish them, they are your servants, they are your property, you can do what you like with them. Wa in ta'fir lahum fa'innaka anta lazizul hakim. But if you forgive them, you are exalted in might, you are wise. He is coming along to bring you back. You have a thousand different churches and denominations among the whites of South Africa and three thousand among the blacks. And each, is, each and everyone is sending the others to hell. So, you have Trinitarians and Unitarians, and you have all types of things among you. He is coming along to tell you that all this you had it wrong. To put you right, he has to come along to rectify his people. And he's telling you that on that day, when he's going to come back, say, many will say to me on that day, 
Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty works? You, the Christians, fantastic jobs that you're doing. Building hospitals, educational institutions, sending scud missiles, scud missiles. Not Saddam, he did his job, he did his worst. He's had it. But here, I don't know if you've seen this. This is coming from America. Look at this. You know what it says? You know what it says. The stem there looks like yes. Desert Storm, United States Central Command, coming from the United States Central Command. Desert Storm. Wouldn't you like to read this? To know what happened men here, how they came and how they went, what, what they did? Wouldn't you like to read it? Desert Storm. You know what's Desert Storm? Huh? Yes, something just passed by now, near that whirlwind. You remember? Yeah, the scud missiles that dropped on Riyadh, and I don't know whether there's any came to Jubail, I don't know. But don't you like to read about it? So they're giving it to our children. And so many other things besides. You take it home, and then they have this... Uh, people love to have it uh, autographed. So it says here, presented to... So what's your name, my child? Brother, what's your name? Abdullah. So Abdullah from John Smith. Date. You're going to treasure this. Desert storm. Take it home. Put, keep it. And then your son or your grandson will read this. You know what's inside? Good news Bible. Good news Bible from America. <laughs> you see? This is, I said, look, what are you trying to do? Why deceive the people? It's a type of sickness. Look at this. No greater love. No greater love. You think it's a love and romance. You like to read it, no? <laughs> Who doesn't like to read? When I was young, I know I was yearning for this sort of thing. Love and romance, love and romance, true love, true romance. You open inside, what's there? What's there? Guess. Bible. Bible. Catching fish. I said, is this your religion? Is it what Jesus teaches you? He said, be ye as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves, like a snake. Did Jesus say that? You be like a snake going into people's homes and go and bite them like the snake in the Garden of Eden. What he did, the devil, he went into the shape of a snake to mislead Adam and Eve. Is this the same snake-like game? Desert storm, there's no greater love, and I give you a dozen more. I give you a dozen more. What is this? He says, no, come my brothers, come. Come, let us reason together. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. The Quran says, ya ahlal kitab ta'ala. We have stopped doing that. You do that. Ta'ala. Call them. Talk to them. Have tea with them. Give them our nice, nice, you know, all the lovely things that we eat, you know. We in my country, samosas and bhajiyas, I tell you, it does the job. You do the same. So, now, what is, what are you up to? We are prepared to talk and no disguise. We have, huh, I, can, I can show you some scud missiles that have come to this country. I don't know whether we have the time. Scud missiles. Impossible. Impossible. Scud missile. You see the one that Saddam sent. It killed a few of our brothers and sisters. According to our belief, they are Shaheed. They will go to heaven. Their life was shortened here. Maybe some children orphaned, some women widowed, but as far as the, the people who died, they will go to heaven. That's our belief. Am I correct? They will go to heaven. They will be rewarded. Allah will reward them. But here is another type of missile, scud missile, that when you accept this one, when this hits you, you go to hell. So what are you talking about? I said, look, this one came from Germany. You say, Almania, Almania. They are friends with us. They have the embassy here, and they are good people. Like the Americans, I said, they're good people. It's not the American army, not Bush. Bush didn't send that desert storm, that, this type of desert storm. Don't blame Bush. Don't blame the, blame the Americans. We must thank them for what they have done, the sacrifices they have made. I said, I take off my hat to them. But this is coming from Germany, not from Baghdad. Not from Saddam. It's coming from Germany. It came and fell in Riyadh. There's a stamp here. Riyadh. And it bounced and went into 
What's his name? Bureida. 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 The stem from Bureida is here. It bounced and went to Bureida. And the person in Bureida, he opens it. Look at this beautiful production, beautiful literature. Ah, ha, ha. You know, silk, silk, everything is silk. Look at this. Beautiful. I think, you know, you're too far, but what can I do? At the back is a calendar, whole year, free calendar. Two years calendar, two years calendar, free. <laughs> Look at this. I don't know whether you can read. Anybody can read? Allah? Yes. That's what everybody reads generally. Allah Muhammad. It looks like Allah Muhammad. I showed to an Arab sheikh in Jeddah. I said, Ya Akhi, look at this. It's Allah Muhammad. I said, Ya Shaykh, have another good look. It's Allah Muhammad. I said, Ya Akhi, Akhi have, have a good look. Then it's Allah Muhabba. And a Saudi old sheikh got caught. <laughs> what is me? What is me? If I get, get, get caught in the Pakistan, in the Bangladesh, he gets caught. You blame him? Hmm? This one here, beautiful sticker in gold and black. It's written the Abbana. I read it first time when I saw it. It says Rabbana, Atina, Fiddunya, Hasanatam. Then somebody told me, no, it's not Rabbana, it's Abbana. Oh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. In Arabic. Deceiving our little children. Like a snake in the grass, you know. So Jesus said, be ye as wise as serpents, clever like snakes. This is like clever like snakes. Another one, beautiful color. Same thing, to your calendar. Here. Is a man with a lovely beard, better than mine. Do you agree? He's KK Alawi. He is a Murtad. He's become a Christian. So now he's telling all of us how. And inside you sign verses from the Quran. What do you do? We are trained. Every Muslim is trained. When you see ayahs of the Quran, we kiss it out of respect and we put it next to the Quran. A snake in the house. <laughs> if you can't read English, if you can't read English, they got it in Arabic for you. Huh? Kiss it and keep it next to the Quran. <laughs> All this beautiful literature. There's one here particularly of interested me very much. Kaifa mm Nusalli. -hmm. How do you pray? Hmm? How do you pray? Put your head down, put your bump up. Is that the way to pray? No, that's 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 the joke. How do Kaifa Nusalli? This is coming from this cut missile is coming from Germany. Not from Britain, not from America. This came from Germany. Kaifa Nusalli. How do you pray? Heads down and bumps up. Is that the way to pray? But you see, I have a book in answer to that. But not knowing this, we have a book called The Muslim at Prayer. And in it, we show you that everything the Muslim does is nothing new. It's something in his own holy book. Taking off the shoes. As you enter the mosque, it's the first take of your shoes. So why do you take off your shoes? I am telling them that in honor of the commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. When he was on Mount Sinai, God spoke to him and he said, according to the Bible, and he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. So in respect of that commandment, we Muslims, we take off our shoes. Kaifa Musalli. Before we go in, I said we make ablution. There are three good reasons I can think of. Number one, purely from the hygienic point of view. No one is going to find fault with the person who washes himself five times a day. It's a good hygienic practice. And everybody says yes. Secondly, I said it serves certain psychological purposes, meaning mentally it's preparing the person for prayer. I'm washing not because I'm dirty, because I'm going to stand before my Lord. Mentally is preparing me for prayer. Thirdly, I said this is also another commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses in the book of Exodus. That is the second book of the Bible. It is written, And Moses and Aaron and the sons washed their hands and their feet thereat when they went into the tent of the congregation, the place of prayer. They washed as the Lord commanded Moses. So we Muslims are still fulfilling another biblical commandment. In our Salat, we stand up and ruku and sujood. And when we go into the sujood, this is what they're laughing at. Kaifa nusalli. How do you pray with heads down and bumps up? I'm telling them, I said, that is how your Jesus prayed. Your Lord, your God, that is how he prayed. And every prophet in the Bible prayed like that. And I quote you. It says, and Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. 
And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. When we come to the New Testament, we read that towards his last days on earth, Jesus Christ, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples and he said, wait and watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. What did he do? He said, wait and watch. Keep God, because the Jews are after my life. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. I'm asking you, how does a man fall on his face and pray? If there is another way, teach us. We want to learn. Can a circus acrobat do any better than that? Tell us. But no, this is how your Lord prayed, your Jesus. But you have lost touch with it altogether. You don't know. So I'm just, we want to, you to go back to the teachings of your own prophets. Because if you go back, if you follow the example of Jesus, you will be a Muslim. Jesus was circumcised, you ought to be circumcised. Jesus never had the pig in his life, you should not touch the pork. And so on. Every aspect, you find that the Muslim is the closest to Jesus in his teachings as well as to the prophets of God. There's a question which is relevant here. Someone wants to know already how to become a Muslim. Yes. My, may I know what is the way to become a Muslim? And... Ignore the second part. It's difficult to decide. Yes. It's also for you. Yes, I thought it was part. only me. <laughs> Very easy. You see, first thing, you get the right concept of God. Number one, you have the right concept of God. That your God Almighty, He is, as the Bible says, the God is spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in truth and in spirit, not in form, shape, or size. Because the most beautiful mental picture you create of God Almighty is a figment of your imagination, and you are not to worship your imagination. Right concept of God, that He is the one and only being who has a right to tell you what to do, what not to do. And he's not like a man, he's not like a monkey, he's not like an elephant, he's not like a snake. Got it right? Anything you think or imagine is not him. Laysa Kamislu Hishai. Not only there's nothing like him, but nothing is like the likeness of him that can be imagined. Got it right? He said, right. And you believe that Muhammad is the messenger of God. He's a true prophet of God. So whatever he tells you, you accept. Because it's God speaking through him. He says, don't drink alcohol. Stop it. Don't argue. He said, don't eat the pig. Don't argue. Don't be promiscuous. Don't argue. Whatever he tells you, you accept. You are a Muslim. The others are all details. Once you accept that, that there is but one God and Muhammad is his messenger, the rest is detail. So that is the way you accept Islam. Thank you very much, Sheikh. There is a gentleman who has been waiting quite patiently. And I think um, also we need to move rather promptly for the further questions. Can you please advance? Uh, I am a, a Christian by name, a Muslim maybe by heart, because I want to, uh, I want to know or about this Surah Bakara verse 62. It is it, uh, about you are a believer of the, Jew, uh, the Quran, you are a believer of the Jewish scripture, a Christian or a Sabian. You do good work and believe in the last judgment. You have a gift from your Lord. So there are four religions there mentioned. What is the true religion? Is this true religion is stated there in the book of the Christian Bible, James 1, 27. You can read there in the Bible because I have no Bible here in Saudi Arabia. You are also giving me quite a big task. Let me see the Quranic verse that you mentioned. It looks like you have read it. Beautiful. I'm very happy. That means you must have got the Quran at home. At the moment, you don't know where you are. He says he's a Christian and a Muslim at heart. He can't be fish and fowl at the same time. You know, this is not religion. Either you are a Christian or you are a Muslim. You can't be fish and fowl at the same time. But he wants to be safe, like that old lady 
She was burning candle for St. Peter and for the devil. The old lady, she wants to make sure she's burning a candle for St. Peter, that when she goes on the other side, if St. Peter is there, uh, she's got, can intercede for her. He says, you see, look, I used to burn candle for you. And suppose St. Peter is not there. If the devil is in charge, then what? So she burns a candle for the devil as well. So in case the devil is there, so look, I burned a candle for you as well. So, you know, I'm a Muslim in the heart, and maybe I'm a Christian. I don't know what I am. Maybe fish and fowl. However, let's see what our brother is trying to ask. It says here, Inna lazina amanu, wal lazina hadu wa nasara, wa sabiina, man amana billahi, man amana billahi, wal yawmil akhiri, wa amila salihan, falahum ajruhum inda rabbihim, وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزُنُونَ Masha. What is the problem? Allah is telling us, whether you are a Jew or a Christian or a Sabin or whatever, if you believe in Allah, I just told somebody just now. You remember how to become a Muslim? Number one, you believe in Allah. What does it mean, believe in Allah? It's a very easy thing, I believe. What do you mean you believe? He tells you, don't eat the pig. And he said, look, I can't do without pork chops. You believe in Allah? He says, be circumcised. God entered into an eternal covenant with the Jews and those who accept the scripture, the Bible, that you must be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, every male child. Your Lord Jesus was circumcised and you are not circumcised. What kind of religion are you? He said, Jesus said, he is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Are you following him? He circumcised, you are not circumcised. He didn't eat the pig, you eat the pig. In which way are you following him? At every step, he said, you must not look upon a woman to lust after her. And you have dancing parties by the millions. Am I correct, sir? In Western Christendom, every nation, every religious group seems to be dancing with other people's wives and daughters. They preach on Sunday a beautiful sermon, thou shalt not look upon a woman to lust. As soon as it's finished, he goes and dances with the people's wives and daughters. In which way are you... He fasted. Are you fasting? You make a mockery of the whole thing. So, when you say you believe in Allah, the Muslim too. You can't say, I believe in Allah, and you do what you like, and you say you're going to go to heaven, there's hell for you. You say you believe in Allah and His message in the Quran, and you are going a directly opposite of what Allah wants you to do, I say you'll go to hell. There's no guarantee just saying, I believe in Allah and the Rasul and His Quran. Are you practicing it? If you believe, that means you do what He's telling you. So Allah tells you, you believe in Allah in the last day. What is the last day? That your personal accountability. You will have to account for your own deeds. If you are a Jew, if you believe that, you are on a good wicket. You are a Christian, you believe that, you have to account for your own deeds. Like the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But the Christian missionaries put a full stop. There's no full stop there. They say the soul that sinned, it shall die, and we are all sinners, we'll all go to hell. Unless you believe that Christ died for your sins, there's no heaven for you, no salvation for you. I said, why don't you finish the verse? The soul that sinned, it shall die. Agreed. You who commit wrongs, you will be punished. God will destroy you for your evil deeds. The soul that sinned, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father be the iniquity of the son. Father Adam, he ate the forbidden fruit. And poor man paid the price with his wife. Full price. We, his children, God will not question us regarding what he did. He said, you know your father Adam, he disobeyed me, so you go to hell. Nonsense. He didn't ask me. Eve didn't ask my wife. How can God punish me and my wife and you and your wife for the sin of Adam? Nonsense. Can't you see? So, he says, the son shall not bear you, the children of Adam, you will not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. There are in America at the moment 25 million sodomites whom they call gays. Qawmilut. Will Allah ask Adam, say, look at your children, 25 million! No, Adam is not responsible. Neither shall the son bear the iniquity of the father, nor the father of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Whatever the good man does, he will get his reward. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Whatever the wicked man does, he's got to pay the full price. But if the wicked will turn, repent from all the sins that he has committed, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. He will not perish spiritually. 
This is Islam. Do you believe that? You are on a good wicket. You have to pay for whatever you do. God, whatever he tells you, you obey. Now God Almighty is telling you in the Old Testament, believe in Muhammad. He's telling you in the New Testament, believe in Muhammad. You said, no, I can't accept him. So I said, look, you will go to hell. Because you say you believe in the scriptures, and I prove to you from your scriptures that this man, Jesus, is talking about Muhammad. Every point, every word fits him like a glove. I show you from the Old Testament, the burden upon Arabia. Isaiah 21, 13. You read it? The burden upon Arabia. You want me to go on? It's all there. Arabia. Is it Jerusalem? Is that America? Is that England? What? Arabia is Arabia. Look, the, any Bible, you bring me your Bible, you open and you read it, if you like to read it to the people, that whole verses, chapter 21, verse 13 onwards. What is it talking about? Talking about Muhammad and his flight from Mecca to Medina and how the people of Medina gave him refuge. The burden upon Arabia. Read it, but no, it won't go down your throat. You don't want to. I'm asking the Christian, have you seen this in your book? No, he never heard, he never saw in his life. The learned man of Christianity hasn't say, seen that word in his life. Talking about the flight of Muhammad. Talking about the first wahi. I end with this. The meeting has to end. Any good thing, you can't keep on continuing for the whole night. Right. I end with this. The first revelation, the first wahi. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa is in Makkah. He goes on to Ghare Hira, the mountain of light. Jabal and Nur. He used to retire to this place, sometimes alone and sometimes with his dear wife, Ummul Muminin Khadijatul Kubra. It was the 27th of the month of Ramadan. There was no fasting month then, it was unknown. But it was the season among the Arabs, Ramadan. And he sees a vision in which the Archangel Gabriel comes to him and commands him in his mother tongue, Iqra, read! And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa being illiterate, unlearned, he says, Ma ana He said, I'm not learned. What can I read? You're asking me to read? I can't read. So the angel of God commands him a second time, Iqra, read! And again he says, Ma ana biqarin. The third time the angel says, Iqra, bismi rabbika allazi khalaq. He said, read in the name of the Lord and cherish who created. Now the holy prophet Muhammad, he grasps that what he was required to do was to repeat because this Arabic word Iqra means to read, to recite, to rehearse, to repeat. So he repeated the words. The first five verses of Surah Al-Alaq, chapter 96. Immediately, the angel departs. He rushes home, sweating all over, asking her to cover him up and so on. You know the details. But now I want to show you word for word how this was prophesied in the Christian Bible which the guy doesn't want to read. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 12, it says in the book, and the book means the revelation of God is given to him that is not learned, saying, read, Iqra, and he says, I'm not learned, ma'ana biqarin. Word for word, fulfillment, but the blind people won't want to see. Word for word. Now, it is your duty, my dear brothers, and my duty. Acquaint yourself. I have literature on all these little topics. What the Bible says about Muhammad, Muhammad the natural successor to Christ, Christ in Islam, is the Bible God's word, Muhammad the greatest, was Christ crucified, and so on and so on. Equip yourself, arm yourself, and learn to open your mouth, then you see how Allah blesses us with victory. As Allah says, He is who has sent his messenger with guidance, الحق, and with the religion of truth. That it may prevail, overcome, and supersede every other deen. المشركون, now, mind the mushrik, the polytheist might not like it. Again, he repeats the same formula. Enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that he's going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you. That's his job, he can do it, but he wants to give you and me the privilege, rotters that we are, to serve his deen and earn the rewards of the prophets of God. The thing is for us to take it and to arm ourselves. What? Not with guns and laser guns and grenades, but here. Arm yourself with knowledge and learn to share and give. I hope you, my brothers and sisters that are listening, will take advantage of the society that is, that is here, who is giving out this literature of mine. See it. And if it is of any benefit to you, you reproduce it, sell it, present it, and it will be much cheaper than what the Christians are doing. Mine's are little booklets. 
like that Scud missile that came from Germany, that type. Not big like this, small, small things, costing very, very little. Do the job. Wa akhir dawana ni alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Brother Ahmed has certainly posed challenges to us all, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. I'm, I'm sure that you would all agree that this has been a very worthwhile experience. Um,